Hey everybody, it's Regina Andler here and welcome to Coffee with Regina. I have a fabulous guest on today. Her name is Lil Barkowski and she has an unbelievable back background. Um, just before we get started, I'll tell you how I met Lil. I met Lil because I am working as a author, a co-author in a book and she happens to be publishing it. And so that was how I met her. And I asked Lil to come on to Coffee with Regina to talk about that kind of stuff. And I always ask my guests for a little bio. And when she sent her bio, I was like floored. I was like, wow, this is really cool. We're going to have a great conversation. So first off, welcome, Lil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. That's my job. And we have our coffee or, what, or, or whatever is in the cup. Mine's, yeah. mine's mostly drained. <laughs> drained my <laughs> there, there, there you go. And... As we get started, I just wanted to ask because, you know, I met Lil all about this publishing, right? And then I get her bio. And the first thing on her bio is that she was a restaurateur and that she was an actor and a musician. And I really need to hear some of this. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I, um, I actually started out wanting to be a writer, but my dad discouraged me because he preferred me being a musician. He'd spent a lot of money on my drum lessons, I think, is what it really came down to. But he was a writer. And my, my dad, yeah, I'm a drummer. My dad, um, my dad wrote a very, very well received uh part a uh, half of half of a textbook. He wrote the chemistry part and a woman wrote the, the physics part for eighth grade students, and it was adopted by 38 of the states. So it was everywhere. You, you kids probably used it. It was called uh, Spaceship Earth. And he was a, a Houghton Mifflin, big you know, he was a big deal. So you know, he read my fiction and didn't get it. And he's like, no, this is any good. <laughs> you should play drums. So I'm like, okay, play drums. So, um, so I stayed, I, and when you're a musician, <laughs> you become involved in the restaurant industry or you find something else to do because you're going to starve to death if you don't. So most of us actor and musician types wind up working in a restaurant. And um, I did a lot of that and eventually owned one, uh, eventually owned actually two cafes and art museums, which is, was kind of a really good niche for me. Um, and I just, you know, it was I kind of burned out of that over the years, but I always played to this day. I played music on Sunday, actually, with, with some people. One of my my friends had a CD release party and I played some drums with her. Um, we have a lot of fun together. So oh, um, that, yeah. that, that is so cool. Now, when you were doing the musician thing, were, were you part of a specific band or anything like that? Oh, yeah. I've been in bands since I was, geez, my, my buddy Joe and I walked into a pizza parlor and in in Bergenfield, New Jersey. And he was, he looked older. I looked older. He was 16. I was 17, I think. And the guy had just fired a band because the lead singer was 17 and he had, they had to be 18. And we said, Oh yes, sir. We are certainly eight. We're he's 19 and I'm 20. <laughs> and we were, <laughs> and we played there like every Saturday night after that. It was really great. Our parents would come and I think our bass player was 16. <laughs> we just said, I don't know what happened. So they let us play. It was really fun. We played everything from American legions to whatever, but I've played every kind of band from Southern rock to heavy metal to you name something. I played drums in it. So Jay, I bet I've studied with the jazz drummer. So a very famous one, as a matter of fact, um, I, that's what I studied. So I, I, I really prefer you know, old standard jazz and uh, you know rock and pop and that kind of stuff. Oh, I love that. And I have the same kind of music genre that I enjoy too. So, I mean, that's right down my alley. It's like that, that, that just, uh, when I saw that in your bio, I, I was like, Oh, I need to know about the musician stuff. Cause that's so much fun. And you know, is so it's still a hobby of yours to do that. And you know, you said you play on Sundays, so, you know, it's, I did, yeah. Yeah, it, that it's, I don't know, it's, that that's so cool. And, and you know, I'm, I'm totally transparent here. I'm going to tell you why, it, why I'm so fascinated by it. It's because when I was younger, I took piano lessons, I took guitar lessons, I took flute lessons. I'm really no good at instruments. <laughs> Nothing ever stuck. And I mm -hmm. so wanted to be a musician. And so musicians fascinate me because it's one of those things that, for whatever reason, I just was not given the gift of musician. I love music. I just can't seem to get any. Well, I, I could play the tambourine. <laughs> you get rhythm. <laughs> I think. I think if you, you know, I, I wrote a book called Accelerate with a um a football player, an NFL football player. It's a really good book. We're actually promoting it again next month in October, rather. And um, one of the things I said in the book was that the kids, if they they, they can be very talented at something and not want to do that thing. Or they can really want to do a thing and have no given talent in it and they have to work hard toward it. 
And I think that if you, you know, if your parents want you to be something, you don't want to be that you should pick, be what you want to be. Even if you're greatest, my, my adopted daughter is one of the most fantastic actress, natural actresses I've ever had the, you know, the pleasure to work with. In fact, she was an acting student of mine, came to live with us for a while, but she won't act. She doesn't want to act. She doesn't like it. it. It for her, she could do like she's rolling off a log. She wants to be a musician, so she's worked her tail off to be a musician. And she's really, it wasn't natural to her. It didn't come to her, but she works every day at it. Now she's teaching music, and she's been invited to do a jazz ensemble at a college. They've given her a free ride to get her uh, her AA if she'll be in the jazz ensembles. I mean, that's how good she is. But she put her mind to it and stuck to it to a point where. She's going to do it and she's doing it. God love her. It's good. Really yeah. Fun. Good for her. That uh, I just didn't have the stick to itiveness that had behind it. I was like, <laughs> I really love music. And I just resigned to the fact that, you know, after, you know, here's part of, you know, as I'm older now, part of why I think that I had such a challenge as a kid learning because they all taught me how to do everything righty and I'm a lefty. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so, I kept getting frustrated because they were like, well, you need to do it this way. And it just didn't feel right. And even though they knew I was a lefty, they didn't know how to teach me as a lefty. And so mm -hmm. I think that was what kind of threw me off. And I just got frustrated. And I was like, you know, I'm a lefty. I wasn't meant to play anything because lefties don't play things, which is totally not true. <laughs> no, of course not. Guitar, guitar is a little, guitar and bass and that kind of thing. String instruments are a little difficult left-handed because um, there are a lot of people who can teach you. Uh, piano obviously comes to mind, but then you still have to change your brain power because your left is your bass hand and your right is your treble hand. You're going to be like, you know, you have to just train your head to, to think that way. Uh, I would think a wind instrument would probably be the best. Something like a French horn might have been a great instrument for you or a trombone, something where there really was none of that to be involved, you know, where left and right mm. wouldn't matter. French horn would have been a great instrument for you probably, but just I getting would, the armature would. right. I and wish that's I a, and that's an instrument that. nobody wants to play, and every <laughs> college will take you. If you can play the, the – here, kids, listen, <laughs> and parents, if you want your kids to go for a free ride, contrabass, bassoon, bassoon, uh, any double read an instrument, oboe, Anything like that and French horn, there's so few people that are that good at it that the colleges are desperate for those instruments, particularly the the um the bass, the the, the contrabass and the, the bassoons, those are those are ones, man. They, if you could play that, you you could suck at it and they're gonna give you a free ride. Because <laughs> they got somebody playing that instrument in the orchestra and nobody wants to play it. So anybody oh, who wow. played oboe got into college on oboe scholarship because he was pretty decent at oboe, but he wasn't great. But he was good enough. That's all they needed. Somebody to blow into the oboe with the orchestra. They got in for free. That That's is weird. amazing. Yeah, yeah. So you got to pick the instruments that are and, weird. And, um, and so you you were talking about the, the 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 book that your dad wrote with the school book and everything. Mm -hmm. And so you went to the musician, the actor uh, stuff in the restaurant here. At what point did you turn around and go, you know what? Um, I really want to write. I really want to do this stuff. At what point did you turn around and say, you know, this isn't what I want to do. I want to start this publishing business kind of thing. It's it's a really weird road. I would say I, I have the dream job. I never knew I wanted. Um, I, I nobody. I don't think anybody a kid wakes up in high school and goes, you know, I want to be a publisher. <laughs> I think I'm going to be a publisher when I grow up. It's very rare the kid that thinks that and that maybe comes from a family that does that. But uh, and I don't obviously. But it, it, it kind of wound around to that. I I always wrote some. I wrote in high school a lot. I wrote. I stopped writing. I, wrote, I took some college classes again. Like I had college teachers tell me, "This is your calling. You should be a writer." And I was like, oh, "I don't know, maybe," you know, sort of thing. Um, but and in fact, my acting teacher thought I should be an actor, and I didn't really want to act. I wanted to direct. I wanted to be what he was doing. I wanted to do what he was doing. So I admired him so. And I wanted to do to be, and I did a lot of directing and I did a lot of, I ran my own theater companies and all that. Cause that was the bent I wanted. So I started doing that because that's what I really liked as an advocate, just for fun. And I had a lot of training and acting. So I thought, well, this will be good. And then I started writing plays because we didn't, couldn't find plays we really liked. So I started writing them. <laughs> so, you know what, let's write a play. Wow. And I wrote a few plays and they, they were so well received and it went up so well that I started going back. And my ex w was a fantastic writer, science fiction, fantasy. And I started to try to write. And she said, here's where you're going wrong. <laughs> I said, okay. So I, we were right. I still hopefully someday I'm going to go back to that novel. I started to write a novel and it was terrible. And and then she said, do this, do this, do this, do this. And I went back at it and it got better. And I just kept writing. But I found that dialogue was better for me in terms of writing. I write a lot of dialogue, even in the books I do write. There's a ton of dialogue in it. 
because that's where I think my strong suit is in writing is probably that. And even if you're writing a memoir or you're writing a business book, put some dialogue in it, breaks things up. Don't just blather words out on paper. People want to feel that interaction. Like if, you, if you're going to tell a story about how you help somebody that you work with, make some dialogue up about what your interaction was with them. And I think that really breaks things up and, and we call it pattern interrupt in a book. So that's kind of a cool thing. So anyway, one way, one thing led to another. I ran into a gentleman in a networking group. I ha we own a, we still do own a web development and marketing company, Virtual Creatives, which is my email address, little at virtualcreatives.com. And I wanted to do some writing and he needed ghost writers. And I quickly got on board with him and I wound up being his vice president. And then he got very sick. And we had eight books that had to be published all at one time at Christmas time. He was down for the count and I had to learn. And I did, I had to learn what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong. And um, when I got, when he got better, he was pretty broke. He couldn't afford me to be on board anymore. And I said, well, good luck. You know, thank, I worked for nothing for him for a long while. And then I went on and started my own company about, I started my own company about five years ago, I guess. Um, it was, and it's Ghost Writers Network, GWN. But we don't ghostwrite as a, it, we got less and less into ghostwriting and more and more into publishing. So ah. we started out we started out primarily being ghostwriters and, and editors. And then people wanted publishing. I'm like, well, we know how. So if you, we'll give you a deal. If you ghostwrite with us, we'll, we'll throw the publishing in for a certain amount more. And one thing led to another to now where we publish a whole lot more than we ghostwrite. So we took the initials, G, ghostwriters. Ghost Writers Network, GWN Publishing. Thank, so thank people... you for thank you for saying that because when I saw that, and even when I saw it before, I was like, "What does GWN stand for?" Yeah, because <laughs> we don't I want don't... people say, "Well, we, at first couple of books actually say Ghost Writers Network Publishing," because the first you know, and then people like, and and honestly, the first couple of books we didn't ghostwrite. I I did ghostwrite one of one of the early on, but after that, I was like, "Yeah, people are like that's not cool. People are gonna think we ghostwrote this book and we didn't write it at all." We edited, so um, so we had to do something. Just just out of curiosity, what you know, when you talk about ghostwriting, I I don't know if I fully understand what ghostwriting is. I mean, when you ghostwrite for somebody, it's I mean, it's their story. So are you just like taking their ideas and then putting all the stuff behind it? I steal their ideas and I run away to a cabin in the woods. No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it works. But. How it works is a couple of ways. Um, most of the major pub people you see published, like you know, they, they have somebody write their book. They didn't write any of it. They'll they usually they're piecing together stuff or they interview them. With us, for the most part, I interview the person. Like I'll sit down with them for a couple of hours, especially business books. We'll outline what we want the business book or memoir or success book. We do a lot of success stories. Like this is how I got to be who I am, and here's how you can get there. Hmm. Or tips and trick books. You know where this is how you get through divorce, or this is how you know. So we'll outline the whole book and we'll say, okay, these are the chapters. This is what we're going to be doing. And then once a week I meet with them and we, we work on one chapter at a time and they just talk and I write, make notes and I record it so I can go back later and listen to it. And then I write them. I write the chapter, not them. I, I take what they've said and actually make a, a, you know, a clear and coherent chapter from each, each segment of the book. And then I send it to them. And usually it takes a couple of days. They get a chapter. They look at it and they say, okay, that sounds pretty good. Or, hey, I forgot this. Or and they, they maybe make me some notes. One lady used to write me notes. On, 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 she used to print the chapter out and then write write in pen <laughs> and send it back to me. I'm like, oh, dear God, I couldn't read her handwriting. <laughs> no, but so, but I would fig I'd figure it out, you know. And um, most of the time, like, like, then then we'll go to next week, go to the next chapter. Unless we're stuck on something, we, we do a chapter a week pretty much. And, and we're done in 12 weeks or so with the whole book. Um, if it's fiction, which I've also ghostwritten, that tends to fall mostly to me. Somebody will come to me with an idea and, and I'll run some ideas by them. And I'll meet them once every week or two to go over what I'm working on. But it comes out of my head. For, from there you know they'll, they'll say i want to write a book about this subject or that subject or i have this i have this kind of idea in these characters and they've, they'll give me everything they know already and then just throw it at me and tell me to go write it and I, I pretty much write those from scratch and then there's people who have a bunch of stuff they have blogs they have otters from podcasts like this one where they recorded everything and they could send me word documents 
they've got articles they've written, they've got interviews they've done, and they we outline it and I plug and play where those things should go and then create create a book and we work together to smooth the whole thing out into um, that kind of thing. I had a lady who is a nurse and a lawyer. And so she had a ton of blogs on nurse, what the troubles that nurses get into legally. And so I, she, she outlined it and we just plugged in all the different things she had where it made sense. And then I, I cleaned it all up so that it made a nice smooth transition from idea to idea. So that's kind of what I do when it comes to writing. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of money. <laughs> so, a lot of money. Uh, mercy. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's like, wow, that, it, it, that's very impressive. You know, it's like, it's it, all that reading and, and writing and editing and all this stuff that you do. It's, I, 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 you know, power to you. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know if I would have the patience to go through all that. It sounds, however, like the ghostwriting piece, especially for somebody who wants to do their memoirs or something and doesn't really know how to go about writing a book, that whole process of the, you know, listen to their story and then put it together and stuff like that. It sounds like it would be great for somebody who wants to write their memoirs. We do a lot of memoir. Um, I've written a lot of memoir. I've written some really crazy memoirs and um, some tragic stories and some difficult stories and people, you know, I've had tough times and they just can't write that. They need me to write it for them. And I think like I've said this many times, one of the biggest compliments I ever get is people say the difference between me and other ghostwriters is that I somehow always know the right question to ask. Like I'll come up with a question that nobody else had the, maybe the guts or the, the Jersey to ask, I guess maybe, I don't know. So. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. And then, and then you've got all these people that are just writing a book. Now I, it, it seems to me just, I mean, looking out on Facebook and stuff like that. And I know I'm one of them too. I, I've, I've been in the process of multiple compilation books, um, co-author books at this point. And so I know that's how I met you is to, is through uh, Terry Levine's book that's coming out and, you know, it's a compilation book. Is, is that, I just see tons of people doing that these days. Is that like the thing nowadays is all these co-authored books? There seems to be a lot of them out there. There are. Um, I think it's kind of become a, 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 a way for people to get started as writers, for one thing. Um, a lot of people want to speak and coach. It's really a good idea to have something written that plausibly say I'm a, I'm a published author. Um, we are trying to get somebody to understand that this could be great for high school students. I think that imagine on your, on your college application, you say, I'm an Amazon bestselling author. Wow, that's a great idea. I know, I know it is. And, I'm trying to, <laughs> and if we could get people to, to, to sponsor these kids to write their own chapter about their journey or um, where they are, and you know, get some, I think it'd be a fantastic thing to do because, I, and then you know, we get 10 or 15 or 20 of them to write in a book and, and you know, get that, get that Amazon badge if we can, and then they can put that on their, on their resume, Amazon best selling author. I think that you know, in the book, so and so, you know, stories of my life kind of thing or whatever. And we have a couple people looking at it. Ja uh, um, Jackie Bailey is trying to put one together. She's in, I don't think she's in your book. She's in one of the other books. But yeah, so people do that. It's a way to get started. And I've yet to do a compilation book, and hopefully I never will, where someone in the book who's done one chapter comes back to me and says, well, I really, this was just an idea. This is just the framework for the book I want to write. Mm -hmm. And then they'll come back and they'll they'll write their own book and they'll be working on it. I've got at least one or two in every book uh, of compilation books that are in process with me now of being coached by me or writing with me or you know helping i'm um, helping them you know and most of them write them then they wrote that write their own book mm -hmm. they just maybe a little coaching i've got one client in fact i mean this afternoon who was in one of our compilation books and now she's writing her whole book she doesn't need me to write it she just needs me to coach her and keep her accountable and then we're going to publish the book at the end of the day when she's done hopefully in a couple of weeks so I like to say it's like tattoos. I'm probably the one of the few people in the world who's ever gotten one tiny tattoo and never wanted another one. <laughs> like somehow people get tattoos and oh, I think I'll get another <laughs> and until they come to stuff. And I think writing can be like that. Like, you know, I you get it's the ink you can't stop inking, I guess. So they just get so excited about writing one chapter. They're like, This was fun. Oh my god, my I go to Amazon and it has my name and you know, I'm in one major motion picture and I and when I go to IMDb and I see my name, I'm like, yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> you know, like, so I, I, all right, wait, all right, which one? I was, uh, I had a small speaking role in the movie Monster with Charlene Theron, um, for which she won a Golden Globe and an Academy Award. So the film got a lot of attention. I made a lot of money. <laughs> it's for saying four wow. lines. 
I said about six, <laughs> but they got out to him. Um, I think I think I like seriously about six lines in the whole movie. But but it's cool. And you know, when you get attached to that kind of thing, writing's like that too. It's like you get so excited about it, you just want to keep doing it. And um, I think that's what happens. Terry, Terry, God, I don't know how many millions of books she's written. Like she's she's like Stephen King of, of business books. <laughs> like, stop. <laughs> That's a, that's a great analogy with our the Stephen yeah, King's Stephen business. King. <laughs> like, like there's no paper left in her home. And the pens have been torn to nub. And the pens are in garbage now. So, so, when, so when, you, when you when you when you think about you know writing a book, is it, do you have like any like tips for somebody who maybe has never written anything? Maybe they're a new business person, new coach, or something like that, and they're going, okay, everybody keeps telling me I have to write something. Where do I start? Outline. You know, start start with an idea. What's your idea? Write down your four or five best ideas you think you are, you know enough about subject wise. Like you want to write a book. Like Regina, what if you were going to write a book on your subject? What would be the thing you think you could talk off the top of your head for an hour about? Going through life, <laughs> how, how how to manage life in in a way that makes it most beneficial for you. I think I mentioned to you, hey, and so you know, this is being recorded. This is live, right? So Lil, I'm gonna I'm gonna say what I said to you because I told you this idea that I had. I don't know if I should put it out there in public. I think it means if I put it out in public, it has to happen, right? My my idea is life is like a game of Frogger. And it, it's if you've ever played Frogger before, yeah. all right. So you so you know, you, you you start and then there's these logs going back and forth, and you have to navigate across, and then you get to the middle, and it seems easy to get to the middle, right? It seems kind of that's the easy level and you get there and then all of a sudden the river's going a little faster. The logs are going a little faster. <laughs> There's things that eat you on the log that you have to avoid. And your, your goal is to get to the other side. And I have this entire story and picture in my head about how to use that as the analogy for life. And okay, that's what I want to put on paper. <laughs> there you go. So now you just told your audience basically how do I write a book? Because what you do is you have some idea, right? You think I want to write a book about, okay? Um, my friend, uh, my friend Aziz and I wanted to write a book for teenage kids that were like not sure how to navigate high school and college. Like how do I get, before you even get into high school, you're about to get into, or you're like a freshman in high school, how do you navigate certain things? How do you, you know, how do you choose a career? How do you, how do you get a mentor? What, what does networking mean? Should I be doing something? What's a side hustle? Should I be doing something by the time I'm a junior? I have a very good friend that started a side hustle at 14. He was mowing lawns. He got to the point where his mom had to drive him because he had a tractor and he had all this stuff. Super ambitious. Then he decided at 16, this is hot. I'm in Florida. Don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to learn to tear computers apart. By 17, 18, he was, he was making 60 bucks an hour tearing apart computers. Now he makes 100 an hour. You know, so he knew right off the bat like what his side hustle was going to be, like this thing he was going to do. And and he, that wound up being his life. You know, So we try to teach kids those things. So we made a decision. This was our audience. So I think the very important thing is who's going to read it. That's I think if you know who's going to read a book, that, then you know what you're writing about. Like I, my, I always say, I went to college to learn three words, know your audience, <laughs> know your audience. So who's the audience for what, is there an audience for what you're going to read, right? What you're going to write, rather. who's going to want to read it? And what do I know really well that I could talk a whole lot about and I could put on paper that'll help other people? And my, my speaking platform, when I speak uh, at events or whatever, is writing for the greater good. Hmm. Because I believe and we that's our mantra at GWN Publishing. We publish books that have been written for the greater good. So if you start with that idea, like who am I going to help? Not how much money am I going to make? Not how am I going to become a famous author and somebody's going to you know, put me on the magazine cover? Who is this book going to assist? What is it going to do for someone, for a group of someones, that makes sense for me to bother to write it? And if it does isn't going to do anything, you may not want to be bothered writing it. But if you have something that could help, and in your case, people have to navigate life. It's, it's you know, and maybe younger people reading that book would be, oh, this is what's coming. This is, this is what's in the river. <laughs> be careful. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's the way to look at it. And then you just create a really strong outline. The chapters you're going to write, the major subjects, just like we did in high school when they taught you to outline. What's the major topic, right? That's the, the number. What's the ABCD under it? And then the next thing. And, and then 
before you know it, it's paint by numbers after that. You find things you've already written, articles you've already written, articles that have been written that you want to cite and say, this person's talking about this and here's where it fits in. And then you talk about what you've what that, that meant to you. It's, it's really plug and play after that um, for that kind of thing. Memoirs or biographies, autobiographies. An autobiography is your whole life. I was born and then this, and I'm here is where I am now. A memoir is something weird that happened to you or some part of your life that you want to talk about. I often say I'm going to write a memoir about my two years working at the Trump Plaza in Atlantic City, New Jersey, because that was two insane years of my life. And the things that we've learned and the stuff that happened, there's enough there to write a short memoir about, about that experience and, and what it was like to work on the boardwalk in Atlantic City in the days when, you know, there was a lot of still and, and still is a lot of poverty and a lot of wealth all in one place and all the things that kind of we, we experienced. So if you're going to do something like that, decide what ch what chunk of your life is your memoir, right? Mm -hmm. And then outline those th outline those years. Make a timetable and say this is what I'm going to do. And if you're going to do linear, where you start, you know, in 1985 to 19, you know, 99 or whatever, then chart it out. Make make a chart. This happened. This happened. This happened. And then before you know it, you're writing a book. It's not that hard. What's hard is writing well, <laughs> and that's where a ghostwriter might come in handy. Like. If you don't feel your writing is great, write what you can and then hand it to a very strong editor who can help you copy a line, edit, maybe develop it a little bit with you and and, and proofread it till it's perfect or as close as perfect as possible. <laughs> Nothing is perfect. Yeah, I tell people perfection is, is you know, a relative term. <laughs> a joke is what it is. So, so, so that's so yeah, the... So when, when, when you think about that, I just I, I have a question for you regarding that. You know, sure. a lot of books have forwards and stuff in them so that they're written by somebody else, a forward written by, you know, somebody famous or something like that. Is is that something that's recommended when you write a book is to have somebody else write a forward? Does that actually help a book? It can if the person is well known. Yeah, it really can. And you have nothing to lose by trying to ask. If you've written a book, my old business partner used to say, make a little video on Twitter like, hey, I read, you, I read all your books. I think you're great. And just hit them on Twitter and see if they like they'll answer or wherever they live. You know, if they're, if they're big on Twitter or whatever. Um, you know, you can email people. You can write to them. You can say, hey, listen, I really love what you're doing. I've read every one of your books. It inspired me to write a book. I've written this book. I would love for you to write a little forward or even just an endorsement. Um, so and try to get some endorsements from, from well-known people. And it can't hurt enough to have people see that. And th then they tell people, too. You don't need a forward, but it certainly is a good thing in business book to have for sure. Okay, that no, that th those are really good tips and good ideas on how to do that. So, so the magic question right now is, um, uh, what what are you reading? Everyone's chapters. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have uh, three compilation books going out right now. One is the one you're in. Those are all thank thankfully those have been read and edited by me and or Linda, my Le Linda Hinkle. Thank you wherever you are. Um, she's my editor. Uh, she's fantastic. And so those have been read. Uh, we have them. And that book is mainly about uh, it's called uh, uh, Making Waves. The cover's looking great. Um, and it's about shape, making changes and the ripples you make when you when you in the in, in your business, in your life. And they're terrific chapters. So that's the 16 of you. Then we have um, one that's going out called Victim to Victory. And that is just very powerful, really unbelievably powerful stories. There's 18 people in that book. And they're telling their stories of how oh, they've overcome some unbelievable things. And uh, mm -hmm. one of them was told she'd never walk again. And now she's she dances and, and runs. And uh, she was told at 16, not going to happen. And she said, nope, you're wrong. <laughs> and she just went the other way. So that's great. And then Kim, Kim, uh, not Kim. I'm thinking of Kim is actually in that one book. Uh, Kim's going to start her next book. Kim, wherever you are, next book. Um, <laughs> she's, got, she's the one last year. Um, then there is one with Jackie Finneman. Jackie's doing one called No Problem Parenting, um, and it's raising your kiddos to be more, you know, in a way that's more, um, I, I'm not, I can't say this right. It, it, it basically, it's an easy, it's how to raise it, be easier to raise your children. What what tips can we give you so that you don't fight with your kids and you, you get along with your children and get, the, you get through being a parent? It's great. I mean, there's somebody great. There's 21 people in that book. I think 22. Oh, wow. Jackie. So, and they've all written a couple thousand words about their expertise in parenting from, you know, from autism to step parenting to diet and nutrition, uh, all that sort of thing. It's a really great book. So that that's, I've read almost all of those and we're down to, I'm down to, I think I've got four chapters left to read of all of those chapters. So that's what I'm reading right now. I'm sorry. That's it. 
Very exciting kids. It's no fun. <laughs> well, just out of curiosity, if you had time to read something that you wanted to read for you, what would that be? Is it a novel? Is it a documentary? What what, what do you what does Lil like to read when Lil reads for herself, not for somebody I read, else? I read novels. I, mean, I, I, novels. I, I as a kid, I've read everything. I mean, absolutely, I read everything I get my hands on. I'm a big Steinbeck fan. Um, uh, um, William Somerset Mom. My favorite book of all times always will be is a. Uh, um, oh wow, went right out of my head. Uh, William Somerset Mom. Uh, I can't think of that in my head, but I I love all these kinds of you know novels. I read lots of Grisham. I've read uh, John Irving. I think John Irving was a genius, or is I guess he's he died, didn't he? Uh, Pat Pat Conroy. I love Pat Conroy. I love stories. I love that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, everything from the catcher in the rye to, to, you know, of mice and men. <laughs> you know I, yeah, I remember catcher in the rye in high school. So, you know, back then <laughs> it required reading in high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, and now we're banning it. Go figure. Right. Yeah. That's, that, that's a whole subject for another time <laughs> because no, that's no, no. that's a that's a touchy subject and not bad books, kids. let's not do that let's just do, and, and all you're doing is telling kids to read them I mean, we uh, you know the, the books that were banned when we were kids we, we jumped on reading more than the ones that weren't right <laughs> so i don't think you're doing any good doing that frankly yeah it, it's it's almost like go ahead ban them because then they're going to read them so yeah. you, you're, you're kind of convincing them that they need to be a rebel read a banned book <laughs> And, the, and there's not in those books that we have to worry about. I mean, it's not like they didn't learn anything they didn't already know. But, but yeah, those are the kinds. Of, I mean, I've read so many novels, and when I have a chance, and I like I like watching I like watching um, series of on TV. I like I like things that are on Netflix and those kinds of things, and interesting stories and 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 that sort of stuff. I, I prefer that. I'm also a big Disney Plus fan. I like more, all the Marvel stuff. I'm uh, animations. I'm a freak for animations. I think I've seen everything Pixar has ever made. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't know why. You know why? Because I do know why. Because their stories are fantastic. Tell me yeah. a story. You know, I had I got the privilege of hearing um Steven Spielberg speak once at, at actually at the Plaza, and um he spoke about telling a story. Tell me a story. So tell me, tell me. That's what. That's all that mattered to him when it comes to film and, and filmmaking. He said, "All I want to know is what's the story," and he's oh. right. And that's, if you can tell me a story, I'll listen to you. I love that. That that that's it, you know. And I mean, that's the bottom line, right? Yeah. It, if if you have an audience that wants to hear the story and tell the story, because that's what we want. We all want to hear those stories, and you know, especially when it comes to the good stuff too. I mean, there's so much of other stuff that goes on on such a regular basis in this world today that all of these good stories, the story about the yeah, those that was it. What'd you say from the 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 from trauma to triumph? Is that what it? Uh, from victory one. from victim to victory from and victory. i just remember the name of my favorite book i don't know where it went out of my head the razor's edge by oh, william definitely. somerset Maugham, which i found to be one of the most compelling stories of a man and his search for god and, and the universe you know through his life and what what he went through was such a great story and that's the kind of thing and and it and i think it affected the, the person i became because right. he was searching for the person he wanted to be his whole life instead of doing what everyone told him to do to just go work at the bank or do whatever. And he just, he followed this crazy path. And I have done the same thing. And I was blaming my dad. He threw that book at me when I was about 14. And he said, if you can wade through the first 50 pages, this book will change your life. And he was right. And it, it has always been my go-to for how to live your life. And I've written plays that have, that reflected it. And just be the person you're supposed to be. Do the thing, don't let anybody tell you to be something else. Do you, be who you're supposed to be and follow your own path and find your own way to the universe or God or the forces of life or whatever it is you want to call it, find your own way there. And and that's, you'll get to the other side of the river and you'll, you'll make it through the logs no matter how fast the river flows. You know? I love that. And you, and I have not read that book and you just inspired me to read it. I just wrote it down. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant old book. It's been around quite a while. It's, Two two films made of it. It's really quite something. So. Oh, I'm I am definitely going to check out the book and and I and I will keep in my mind that as your dad said, if you can get through the first fifty pages. So I'm assuming that the first fifty pages are like, okay, all right. Is is there a story here? Can we go on? I, I will be persistent. He said that. I, I didn't find it as much that way as he did, but he said it was a little. I could see where it might be considered that way. So but. I, I I will be persistent. I will go through and I will read that because that sounds like it's a fantastic book. And I mean, there's so many out there. So I'm, I'm guessing that's one of the books that you would recommend for people. Yeah, that's one of the ones. Say, on a similar note, Cavalier and Clay. 
um, a great, great story. Uh, and if you're into like, if you're into the whole, co what, how comic books became so popular in the world and why, um, that's a, it's a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, book. But again, the beginning's a little slow. If you get through it and you get to the, to the meat of the story, it's fantastic. But uh, there's a lot of great books in the world. I mean, I, I don't know. I could, I could go on and on about books all day, so let's not do that. There's a million, there's a million books that are worth reading. Yeah, and, and we're over our 30 minutes right now, so I want to honor your time as well and our audience's mm -hmm. time. So thank you so much, Lil, for being here. This has been a fabulous, a, a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I mean, there, again, there's like so much more we could probably talk about. So you'll have to come on again some other time and you know, we'll, we'll carry on some other conversations about stuff because, you know, Coffee with Regina, it's all about that casual chat with a purpose. And um, sure. you have actually thrown out a ton of value and information here, especially for anybody who is thinking about considering writing a book and, and you know, what to do, where to go. And again, your your, your background is so diverse and amazing that you know when you put that into everything that you do it it just adds that extra spark that you know just makes you stand out and be unique in your in your place there so yeah so so love what i do I, i'm always looking up if anybody ever wants to talk to me you know regina will tell you how to get a hold of me <laughs> I, I always always willing to chat with people about book they're thinking about writing or publishing or what how do i go about publishing a book Please yeah. follow me. So that, that, that brings that brings us to if people want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? They can email me. It's L I L Lil at the word virtual and then the word creative plural. So virtualcreatives.com. Um, if you're familiar with Calendly, you can find me at Lil the Ghost. So just go to Calendly and look up Lil the Ghost. And you'll see my schedule and you can pick a time to chat with me and I'd be happy to do that. And all right. Or and, what, and, yeah. And, and maybe after we're done here, you can pop that into the chat on oh, uh, Facebook um, and just add it in. I've got that written down too. So I will make sure that that's out there and then people can get a hold of you if they like and, sure. and, and follow you as well. Do you have a Facebook page for people to follow? Yes, I do. It's a GWN Publishing, I believe, is our Facebook page or maybe Ghost Writers Network, which is our website, ghostwritersnetwork.com and Ghost Writers Network. If you look us up, GWN Publishing should come up on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm just, you know, most places, Twitter, but mostly, mostly with Facebook and LinkedIn people. So catch awesome. us there. All right. Thank you so much for being here today, Lil. No I really appreciated your time. Uh, great conversation. And um, thanks for joining me for Coffee with Regina and a Chat with a Purpose. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now.